The day I moved into my new house was sweltering hot. The midday sun beat down relentlessly as I hauled box after box from the moving truck into the stuffy, stale air of the empty house. Sweat dripped down my forehead and into my eyes as I worked, fantasizing about the ice-cold shower I would take later. I had been waiting for this day for months. After years of cramped city living, I finally had a place to call my own, a spacious two-story Victorian house on a quiet street on the outskirts of town. It wasn't in the best shape, the white paint was peeling, the yard was overgrown with weeds, and the realtor mentioned some quirks with the wiring and plumbing due to its age. But I fell in love with the beautiful wood floors, intricate crown molding, and potential for restoring it to its former glory. Plus, it was in my budget. As exciting as moving day was though, by hour five my enthusiasm was waning. Lifting and carrying hundreds of pounds of stuff left every muscle in my body aching. But finally, after what felt like an eternity of hauling boxes, I set down the last one with a dramatic sigh of relief. I stood there wiping my brow and taking in my new home. The first floor was a maze of cluttered boxes and furniture piled in each room. But I tried to see past the mess and imagine how each room would look once it was unpacked and decorated. The living room would go here, a cozy sanctuary for reading. The dining room there, filled with dinner parties and friends. My office would be perfect in that corner nook, sunshine streaming through the window as I sipped my morning coffee and typed away. But before I could daydream any further about putting my mark on the place, curiosity drew me to explore the upstairs. I climbed the carpeted steps, my hand gliding along the polished wood banister. At the top was a hallway leading to three bedrooms and a bathroom. I poked my head into each room, taking stock of the dusty hardwood floors and outdated light fixtures. The master bedroom would need a fresh coat of paint and new curtains, but its large bay window overlooking the backyard had sold me on it. The two smaller bedrooms would work nicely for guests and as a yoga art space. As I completed the circuit checking out each room, I noticed a narrow door inset between two bedrooms. I turned the antique glass doorknob and discovered steep wooden steps leading up into darkness, an attic. Flipping on the flashlight on my phone, I began climbing the stairs. Each step groaned and creaked under my feet. A draft of hot air rushed down at me along with an earthy, dusty smell. At the top, I fumbled along the wall until I found the pull chain to a single bulb dangling from the slanted ceiling. The faint glow revealed a cramped, sprawling space full of ancient furniture, trunks, and enough boxes and general clutter to fill a hundred garage sales. I wove my way carefully through the maze, ducking under rafters and taking in the contents. Faded vintage dresses and coats spilled out of a worn trunk. An old piano, its ivory keys yellowed and chipped, sat coated in a film of gray dust. A rocking chair missing half its wicker seat swayed slightly in the draft. And the stacks of boxes were stuffed with everything from moth-eaten books to tarnished silverware. Clearly the attic hadn't been touched in ages, which made it the perfect place to start my new home treasure hunt. I was sifting through a box of dog-eared Polaroids when a stray beam of light caught my eye. I turned, and my flashlight illuminated a large metal door inset into the wall at the very back of the attic. It was made of riveted steel and covered in peeling beige paint. A heavy padlock and thick chain held it tightly closed. My brows knit together in confusion. Why was there a random heavy door stashed away up here? As I took a step closer, I noticed a taped yellow piece of paper stuck to its surface. In sloppy handwriting was a message. Whatever you do, don't open this door. Under no circumstances, this isn't a joke. John A. Chill ran through me despite the heat. What the heck? Who was John, and why was he so adamant that this mystery door remained closed? I tugged on the padlock, but the metal chain didn't budge. Part of me wanted to know what was behind there, but another part said I probably didn't want to know. Still, though, my curiosity burned. I glanced around the dusty attic, as if expecting answers to jump out at me from the clutter. 
but the note wasn't a joke, apparently. John's warning echoed in my mind. Don't open the door, under any circumstances he had written. Curiosity flared within me again, this time even more intense. What secrets lay hidden behind the forbidden door? Something valuable? Dangerous? Sinister? John could be simply messing with whoever found the note, knowing it would drive them crazy, not knowing. Or, what if it was something truly hazardous inside? Toxic chemicals or combustible materials that had to be sealed off? My mind raced with possibilities, reasonable and totally absurd. I forced myself to turn and head back downstairs before I got any wild ideas. I couldn't let an anonymous, vaguely threatening note override my common sense. Plus, I really didn't want to die on moving day in some Final Destination-style freak accident. Still, though, I looked back over my shoulder more than once at the mysterious door as I left the attic. Over the next few days, I focused my time and energy on unpacking. As I decorated each room and made the house my own, thoughts of the attic door slipped away for a while. I almost felt settled into my new home. Almost. Late one evening, I was arranging my bookshelf in the office when I came across a small journal titled Hank's Home Repairs, tucked on the shelf. Inside were pages filled with various plumbing, electrical, and hardware notes, along with vague diagrams and figures. I realized it must have been left by the previous owner of the house. Flipping through the pages, I found advice on unclogging drains, replacing fuses, and even some recommended local contractors for bigger jobs. As I was about to close it, though, the word attic jumped out from the page. Hands trembling, I read the section titled Attic Doors. The attic has two, one normal interior access door leading upstairs, but also one heavy deadbolted door on southwest wall. Previous owner John installed it wouldn't tell me why when I asked. Has it chained up tight with serious locks? Guess he has his reasons. My heart quickened reading this. So John wasn't a stranger, but the actual previous owner of the house. And he had personally installed that massive locked door deliberately to keep people out. Or to keep something in. I stared into space, feeling the pull of curiosity starting to overtake me once again. Part of me wanted to respect John's clear wish to keep that door sealed shut, but I hated not knowing. The mystery ate away at the back of my mind over the next few days until I could think of little else. I had to know what was behind that door. And so late one night, I found myself creeping through the dark house and back up the attic stairs, flashlight in one hand and a hammer in the other. My heart pounded as I made my way to the rear of the attic, half expecting to find the door opened and its secrets revealed. But there it remained, locked up tight just as before. After a few deep breaths to calm my nerves, I got to work. The hammer came down hard on each padlock, the metal crunching and twisting under the blows. One by one, the locks popped open and clattered to the floor. When the final padlock dropped free, the chain loosened around the door. Gripping the icy, cold handle, I slowly pulled it open. A draft of stale air rushed out along with the powerful stench of decay. I gagged and stumbled back. Every instinct told me to flee the attic and lock the door forever. But I had already come too far. Stealing my nerves and breath, I shined my light inside the small room. Cobwebs dangled everywhere, and a thick layer of dust covered the floor. The cramped space was empty, except for one thing, a large ivory-colored box in the center of the room. My breathing shallow, I reached out and brushed dirt off its surface to reveal ornate carvings of flowers and vines forming a rectangular lid. Despite its decrepit surroundings, the box seemed aged but undamaged. Swallowing hard, I held my breath as I slowly lifted the lid. A scream of horror rose in my throat but died on my lips as I stared into the box. A glassy human eyeball lay nestled on a bed of rotted velvet. Shock jolted through me like electricity at the gruesome sight. And then my eyes focused and I realized the truth. It wasn't real. It was a fake plastic and glass model eye 
the kind used in optometry classrooms and Halloween stores. Wave of relief followed by annoyance washed over me. This was all just some stupid prank. John or whoever must have set this up to freak out whoever opened the forbidden door. Just then, something caught my attention from the corner of my eye. I turned and surprise flashed through me. All four walls of the tiny room were covered top to bottom in strange writing scrawled in what looked like red paint or blood. In my initial disgust at the smell, I hadn't even noticed them before. I stepped closer, sweeping my flashlight over the cryptic messages. I see you, monster, murderer. You'll pay for what you did. Killer! Killer! I know what you did! Chills ran through me. What the hell did it all mean? The writing didn't seem fresh, but it gave off a feeling of anger and menace even after all these years. John clearly wanted whoever opened this room to feel threatened and afraid. I shook my head, now equally annoyed and creeped out by the whole bizarre stunt. About to turn and leave, I finally spotted something else on the floor in the corner. A small stained notebook. A predictor's logo was stamped on the cover. Hands trembling, I picked it up and opened it, almost afraid of what I would find inside. The first few pages were full of alphanumeric sequences and odd symbols, as if someone was trying to decipher a secret code. As I kept reading, though, one phrase was scrawled over and over. I will find it. I'm getting closer. Tucked between the pages, I found a faded newspaper clipping about a local murder at a nearby gas station years earlier. The killer was never found. Why did John have this? I dropped the notebook, my heart now thudding rapidly in my chest. There was something very wrong here. This wasn't just some prank. The room had been designed to deliver a real message, a warning. But for who? Me or John? I stumbled out of the attic almost in a trance. The door slammed locked behind me on its own as the padlock and chain re-threaded itself together. I rushed to my bedroom, checking and double-checking that all my own doors and windows were locked. Sleep didn't come at all that night as my mind raced, trying to make sense of what I had discovered. The next morning, groggy from exhaustion, I called out from work. Instead, I found myself at the local library, scrolling through microfilm of old newspaper articles about the house. I had to figure out where John had gone and why he left this bizarre locked room behind like some twisted time capsule. Hour after hour, I scoured the records until finally I found it, a small mention in the real estate section a decade ago. John Peters had sold the house quickly under market value before disappearing from town completely with no forwarding address. Ever since then, the house sat empty and neglected until I came along. John clearly had wanted to leave in a hurry to get away from something, or someone. I thought back to the threats scrawled on the walls. Killer! Killer! Was John hiding from the police? Was there a body literally buried in the basement? I hurried back home, searching for anything I might have overlooked that would explain the hidden attic room. In the kitchen drawer, I found a small discarded notebook. It appeared to be old journal entries written by John. It's out there watching me at night. I can feel its eyes on me even with the blinds closed. I've tried changing all the locks but it always gets back in. It's going to kill me soon if I don't make it stop. I'll find a way to make it stop if it's the last thing I do. I slammed the journal shut, heart racing. John wasn't just paranoid. He seemed completely delusional. This couldn't actually be real. There had be some reasonable explanation. Suddenly, I heard a loud creak above me. I froze. Someone was in my attic right now. I grabbed a kitchen knife and quietly made my way upstairs. At the attic door, muffled steps and dragging sounds could be heard inside, along with the clinking of metal. An intruder was clearly trying to break into that sealed room. Without thinking, I burst inside, flicking on the light switch. Hey, stop! I yelled out. But no one was there. Everything lay still in a thick layer of dust, just as before. Then what made those sounds? I carefully scoured every inch, but found nothing. 
Uneasy and shaken, I decided I couldn't stay there another night. I packed up my essentials to head to a hotel. As I passed by the attic door one last time, faintly scrawled in the dust were two fresh words that turned my blood to ice. I'm here. My mind flashed to John's crazed journal entries about something watching him at night. I ran for the front door, but just as I turned the knob, all the lights cut out. The house was enveloped in inky blackness. I stood paralyzed in fear, listening to the thunderous pounding of my own heartbeat. Then, slow, heavy footsteps creaked on the attic stairs. Something was coming for me. Terror seized me as I fumbled my phone and flipped on its dim flashlight. Turning, I saw a dark humanoid figure swaying at the end of the hall, its face obscured by long, stringy hair. I screamed for it to leave, but it just stood there watching me. Gripped by mortal fear, I lashed out with my knife at the approaching phantom. But the blade passed harmlessly through billowing smoke as the figure dissolved before my eyes. The next few hours were a blur. Police searched the house top to bottom, but found no signs of burglary or intruders. I barely made sense as I told them about the locked room, the writing on the walls, and the shape that vanished into thin air. They chalked it up to stress and an overactive imagination. But I knew what I saw. Staying with a friend that night, I scoured the internet for help, finally coming across a name, Dr. Elias Beck, parapsychologist. I met with him the next day and told him everything. He agreed to come investigate the house and attic room. I waited anxiously for his call. When it came, his voice was grave. You were right to call me. There is a dark presence in that house, something inhuman. I believe the blocked off room served as a containment chamber of sorts for whatever entity John summoned there through his occult research, a protective seal to trap it. He paused. When you opened that door, you broke the seal and released it. You've allowed something very evil back into our world that should never have been called upon. And now it will continue its deadly mission wherever it roams next. His words chilled my blood. What had I unleashed? I pleaded for Dr. Beck's help. He reluctantly agreed to return to try cleansing the home of the evil presence but he warned it would already be too late to stop what I'd put in motion. I prayed he could at least trap it once again before anyone got hurt. Or worse. But deep down, I feared what I had awoken could never be sent back. Here is the rest of the 15,000-word story. I paced Dr. Beck's occult bookstore, waiting anxiously for his arrival. Shelves packed with ancient leather-bound texts and jars of herbs loomed around me. The place smelled of sandalwood, candles, and secrets best left unknown. When I called begging for help, he agreed to do a cleansing ritual on the house. But his grave tone warned me it might already be too late. I couldn't stop thinking about his ominous words, that I had allowed something evil back into this world that should never have been called upon. And now it would continue its deadly mission. The weight of it all made my knees weak. What had I done? I thought back to that night, my curiosity getting the best of me as I broke open the attic's sealed door based only on an anonymous warning note. But how could I have known what would come slithering out of that dark chamber? I should have fled the house that very night after finding the first clues something was wrong. The hidden room, the violent ravings scrawled on the walls, the fake eyeball in the box. But instead I kept digging deeper until it was too late. The shop's bells jingled, jolting me from my thoughts. Dr. Beck stood in the doorway, his gray eyes peering at me from underneath bushy white brows. He silently motioned for me to follow him to the back room. Heavy velvet curtains blocked all the daylight as we sat at a round table, draped in purple cloth. The shelves back here overflowed with skull candles, aromatic oils, fearsome statues and more books so old I was afraid to breathe on them. Dr. Beck's expression remained grim as he explained how he would combat the entity. I cannot destroy what you've unleashed, but only contain it once more within the sealed chamber, he said. My heart sank, but I nodded in understanding. 
He went on to warn me his ritual could draw the entity's rage as it resisted being captured again. You must not interfere, no matter what happens, Dr. Beck cautioned. I will be in a trance state to focus my will against its own. The battle will not be of this earthly plane. I left the shop feeling the weight of dread pressing down on me, but also a faint sense of hope. Maybe Dr. Beck could force the evil presence back into the attic and properly seal it away forever this time. I desperately prayed he was right and that it wasn't already too late. We arrived at my house as dusk settled. I led Dr. Beck up to the attic by the glow of his lantern. The door was cracked open, its chain and padlock lying broken on the floor, just as I had left it that fateful first night. The air had a bone-chilling stillness, as if the house itself was holding its breath. Dr. Beck withdrew several items from his bag, a brass bowl, candles, a dagger, and bottles of oils. I watched in silence as he arranged them in a circle and began chanting in an ancient tongue. The flames turned from yellow to crimson red as he cut his palm with the dagger, letting blood drip into the bowl. A harsh wind suddenly whipped through the attic, snuffing out the candles. In the darkness, a viscous shape began to rise from the bowl, forming smoky, writhing tentacles. Dr. Beck shouted words of power I couldn't understand. The shadowy mass coiled in agony before being sucked back down into the brass bowl. Silence fell again. Carefully, Dr. Beck placed the bowl back into the leather bag. It is done. The etheric seal is remade. The entity is once again bound. I let out of a sigh of relief. We quickly closed the attic door, Dr. Beck muttering prayers as he relocked the padlock and chain. As we turned to leave, a blast of icy wind buffeted us from behind. The sealed door was now wide open again, its lock broken. My blood turned to ice. Impossible, Dr. Beck exclaimed. Out of the darkness, a dense black cloud poured forth, rushing down the attic stairs. Lanterns shattered and candles blew out. It is too late, he cried. It cannot be contained. The house shook on its foundation. I stared in shock at the yawning doorway. Something had been unleashed that could not be forced back no matter Dr. Beck's occult powers. It was loose upon the world for good now. We had no choice left but to flee. Racing downstairs, we found the entity had pulled all the blinds and curtains in the house closed, sealing us in total darkness. It felt like the very walls were closing in, suffocating us. The exit was lost in the blackness. Blindly, I reached out, finding Dr. Beck's hand. Moving as one, we followed the hallway using just touch, praying to reach the front door. My heart pounded ferociously in my chest. A frigid chill closed around us. Out of the void, I could feel an invisible presence circling closer, hungry and enraged. It brushed against me like wisps of cotton. I broke into a panicked sprint, pulling Dr. Beck along. Finally, my hands landed on the front doorknob. We crashed out onto the porch and into the night, gulping the fresh air. Behind us, the door slammed shut on its own. Moonlight revealed the house had fallen deathly still, as if it had swallowed the entity back into its depths. But I knew better. It had escaped into the world now, freed by me. Dr. Beck, pale and shaken, said this was beyond anything he'd ever encountered. He implored me again to leave this place and never return. The look on his face told me he feared there would be no stopping what had been released. I drove us back to his shop, where I begged him for safeguards to protect myself and others from the entity. Reluctantly, he gathered various herbs, crystals, and talismans for me. But his eyes warned me these would only delay the inevitable, not stop it. Before I left, he gripped my shoulders, pleading with me one last time to get as far from that house as possible. I saw stark fear in his eyes. He pressed a pendant into my hand, insisting I wear it always for protection. Taking it, I left the shop, his ominous words ringing in my ears. Over the next few weeks, I settled in at a motel, but I found no peace. My sleep was plagued by nightmares of being suffocated by a black vapor. 
I jolt awake, struggling to breathe. The dreams were a warning. Sooner or later it would find me. I spent my days in the local library, trying desperately to research the entity and a solution. Hidden in the archives, I uncovered some scattered town records alluding to my house's dark history. Evil rituals, disappearances, murders, going back centuries to when it was first built. Some of the original colonial-era owners were rumored to be occultists and witches. The house's wood even came from trees in the old-growth forest they claimed was a place of power. It seemed they had summoned something unnatural there through their black magic rites. And this thing had remained bound to the house throughout the decades that followed. Until I came along. Piecing it all together, I now grasped the full horror of what I had awoken. An ancient evil that should never have entered this world. In my research, I came upon tales of a secret religious order dedicated to fighting these kinds of forces. The Order of St. Lucian was called by the Vatican centuries ago to stand guard against witches, demons, and black magic. If anyone knew how to banish the entity for good, it was them. It took weeks, but finally, through obscure texts and messages on the dark web, I made contact with the Order and begged their help. They reluctantly agreed to send someone to assess the situation and help if possible. I nearly wept with relief. A few days later, a representative named Father Gareth arrived at my motel. He was young, but his eyes looked like they had already seen too much. We sat inside my room, door bolted, curtain drawn. I didn't know who or what could be watching. In hushed whispers, I told him everything. The diaries, the history, the attic, Dr. Beck. He listened, brow furrowed, taking notes in Latin. When I finished, he leaned back looking troubled. I know what this presence is, he said gravely. You are right. It is an ancient evil from a time before recorded history. It cannot be allowed to remain free in this world. I saw my own fear reflected in his eyes. We both knew there was only one option left. The next night, we pulled up near the house under moonlight. It loomed, darker than the night sky surrounding it. Taking only consecrated weapons and equipment, we approached slowly. An unnatural silence smothered the street. The purity of our presence would draw it out. As we crossed the overgrown lawn, the windows all exploded outward, glass raining down around us. We shielded ourselves and kept moving. Father Gareth began chanting in Latin holding a crucifix overhead. The front door creaked open. Inside was pitch blackness. Our flashlight beams could not penetrate the dark. Father Gareth warned me to stay close behind him and keep reciting the prayers he had taught me. Step by step, we moved through the inky black hallway as our words echoed. A blistering cold wind swirled around us. My pendant burned fiery hot against my chest. Father Gareth shouted into the void, demanding the entity show itself. In response, the walls violently shook and floorboards ripped free, crashing around us. But we pushed back with faith and divine will, dispelling the rage. Furniture toppled and picture frames shattered, but we were unharmed as we slowly climbed the stairs, clearing each step. At the top, the attic door hung open, beckoning us nightmarishly to enter. Father Gareth raised a scroll inscribed with ancient sigils and holy words. We both recited a banishment prayer in unison. Roaring wind answered, snuffing out our flashlights and slamming the attic door shut. We were sealed in perfect darkness. The entity slammed into us from all sides like a tornado. We stood back to back, holding our consecrated ground and continuing the prayers despite demonic shrieks of fury. A blinding white light suddenly burst forth, shielding us from the attack. As the light engulfed the hallway, the bedroom doors all flew open at once, and the entity emerged from the abyss within each room. It took shape, writhing and convulsing into a colossal being rising to the ceiling, glowing eyes of hatred forming in the swirling void of its face. It opened a cavernous mouth to swallow our souls. At the precipice between life and oblivion, Father Gareth held forth a glowing vial. 
By the divine blood of the holy martyrs, I command thee back, he thundered. A deafening, inhuman scream filled the house as the light tore through the demonic presence, dissolving its form into smoke. For a moment, all was silent and still, the air purified. Then, one final ominous rush of wind blew out our candles as the entity shot back downward into the very earth. Somehow, we had forced it to depart this world. But as we caught our breath amid the wreckage, Father Gareth spoke again in the darkness. It will return one day. We have only delayed its evil purpose. He blessed me, praying the Lord would keep me from a fate sealed to this darkness. I left town the very next dawn, the house now condemned. Looking back from the road, I glimpsed a sold sign staked in the yard. My heart broke for whoever would call this place home next, unaware of its horrors. There was nothing more I could do but pray the evil within stayed buried away from the light. Over the years, I moved frequently, trying to outrun my guilt over unleashing a nameless horror into the world. The nightmares never fully ceased. I knew we had failed to destroy it completely. Dr. Beck and Father Gareth had both warned me so. It was only a matter of time. I'm slouched in my chair, the only sound the monotonous click of the clock and the distant hum of the air conditioning. It's way past the time when the last of my colleagues usually heads out, their goodbyes a distant echo in my memory. Here I am, still at the console, over time out of a mix of dedication and the fact that I've got nothing better to do. I work as a communication analyst at the Space Agency's control center tasked with monitoring incoming data from various space missions, most of which are automated drones nowadays. The room is dim, lit only by the glow of screens that display an array of data, graphs, and satellite paths. This is the heart of the agency, where space talks back to us, through beeps and chirps translated into something we can understand. My job, like a cosmic translator, is to listen, interpret, and report any anomalies. Usually, it's a calm job, one of patterns and predictability, but not tonight. My eyes are heavy, staring blankly at the screen when a signal breaks the pattern. It's a crackle first, then a steady beep that grows louder, demanding attention. It's out of place, a jagged line on a screen of smooth arcs. I sit up, suddenly alert, and scoot my chair closer to the dashboard. This isn't just any signal. It's strong, clear, and most definitely not part of the background noise I'm used to. I check the clock. It's nearly midnight. I should call it a day, but curiosity has me by the collar. I start tracing the signal's origin, my hands moving with purpose. It's coming from the Mars belt, but that's not the surprising part. It's the signature that's got my pulse racing. It's human, not the sterile, automated pings from a drone. Mark Halley, I whisper to myself. But that's impossible. How could it be him? Mark Halley was the kind of astronaut who had become a household name. His mission was to Mars, a solo expedition that was supposed to pave the way for future manned missions. He was meant to stay on the Martian surface for a year, collecting data, conducting experiments, and proving that Mars could be a second home for humanity. But six months into his mission, all communications with Mark ceased. It's been five years since the control room last received a transmission from Mark. The general assumption was that a catastrophic failure had occurred. Maybe a dust storm had damaged his equipment, or a critical system had malfunctioned, leaving him stranded and unable to call home. The agency declared him presumed dead after extensive search and rescue missions turned up nothing. Mark's mission had been in the Acidalia Planitia, a vast plain on Mars that held promise for its flat surface and potential water sources. When the communication stopped, it was assumed that an unforeseen accident had taken place. Could it be? I shake my head, trying to dispel the ridiculous thought. But as I pull up the signal's file, there's no denying the header marked with his mission's call sign. My heart is a drumbeat in my chest, and a shiver runs down my spine. I stand up, take a deep breath and pace the room. This could be a glitch 
a sick prank, or... I don't know. The possibilities race through my mind. I should report this, but something holds me back. It's not a satellite. It's not a scheduled transmission. The screen displays a series of coordinates and a timestamp that's years out of date. Hey, Alex, come take a look at this, I call out to my colleague, who's sipping coffee by the observation window. He saunters over, curious. Alex peers over my shoulder. Isn't that from the Mars Pathfinder? His voice trails off as we lock eyes, both thinking of Mark Halley, the astronaut who we all believed had been claimed by the red dust of Mars. I click on the audio file attached to the transmission, and Mark's voice fills the room, clear but distant. Control, this is Pathfinder, day 213. Do you read? The room falls silent, except for Mark's voice. A younger analyst, Lisa, stands up, her chair scraping against the floor. This can't be right. Mark Halley is... was... it's been years. Her voice is a mix of fear and awe. I respond, trying to maintain a professional tone. Let's not jump to conclusions. Could be a delayed signal of an old message bouncing back from something out there. But my hands are shaking slightly as I cue up the next recording. Alex nods, but he's not buying it. But that doesn't explain the new data packets attached. This is live somehow. He's tense, eyes fixed on the screen. The station chief, a no-nonsense woman named Commander Evans, strides into the room, drawn by the commotion. Report, she demands briskly. I stand up, facing her. We've received a transmission from Mark Halley's ship, the Pathfinder. It's... Well, it's impossible, but it's happening. Her steely gaze sweeps over the data. Get me authentication on that signal stat, and prep the comms room. We need to analyze every byte of this transmission. Her orders snap like a flag in the wind, and we jump to comply. As the team moves into high gear, I can't help but wonder. What happened to Mark out there in the void? And why, after all this time, is he reaching out now? The cursor hovers over the play button for the next audio file. I glance around. We're all aware that what we're about to hear could change everything we thought we knew about Mark Halley's fate. I click play, and we lean in, waiting for the file to load. The static starts first, a hiss that feels like the sea on a quiet night. Then, out of the white noise, Mark's voice emerges. Control, this is Pathfinder, reporting in for what should be day 214, he begins, his voice steady, but with an undercurrent that suggests sleepless nights. You might find this hard to believe, but I've just witnessed the most extraordinary sunset here on Mars. The sky turned shades I never knew existed. It's... It's beautiful, Mark continues, his voice tinged with a wonder that's infectious. We exchange glances each of us silently acknowledging the surreal nature of his message. But that's not why I'm transmitting. After the sunset, there was... something else. I don't know how to describe it, he says, a hesitation creeping into his tone that wasn't there before. I saw figures. Not reflections, not shadows, but figures. They were just silhouettes against the horizon, and before I could approach, they vanished. It was like nothing I've ever seen. Mark's voice cracks as he speaks. I'm sending this along with some data I've collected. I'm not sure what's happening here, but I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Pathfinder out. The transmission ends as suddenly as it began, leaving a heavy silence in its wake. We sit there, knowing that what we've just heard is either the product of a deep space delusion or evidence of something beyond our current understanding. We gather closer, the air between us charged with a mix of intrigue and apprehension. I hit the play button on the next transmission, and Mark's voice comes through the speakers. Day 225, he starts, a pause hanging briefly before he continues. I'm hearing things, he admits, and there's a vulnerability in those words that's new, that's alien. It's probably just the habitat settling, 
or my own echoes bouncing off the inside of this tin can I call home. There's a forced chuckle, but it lacks humor and feels hollow. But it's odd, he confesses, and there's a hesitation, a breath drawn in as if he's bracing himself to confide something he can hardly believe. It sounds almost like whispers. There's a stretch of silence, and I find myself leaning in. At first, I thought it was just the wind, the natural sounds of Mars that they briefed us about. But this is different. Mark's voice drops even lower. It's like someone is speaking, just low enough that I can't make out the words. It's always just out of reach, just beyond my understanding. The transmission crackles. I've gone over the equipment and triple-checked the seals. There's no breach, no logical reason for these sounds. The comm systems are all green, no sign of external transmissions. There's a pause, a moment of heavy silence before Mark continues. I know the psych evals, the drills. They warned us about space's tricks, the ways the mind can turn on itself when you're the only living thing for millions of miles. I'm not giving into it, but I had to log this. It's part of the protocol. If it's nothing, then it's just a curiosity for the folks back home. If it's, well, if it's not, then it's on record. The transmission ends, leaving a lingering echo in the room. We sit in shared silence, each lost in our own thoughts. The practical part of me wants to chalk it up to the strain of solitude the mind finding ways to fill the silence. But another part, a part I'm not as comfortable with, can't help but wonder if there's something more to Mark's words, something waiting in the red shadows of Mars. I can see the wheels turning in everyone's heads, the unspoken question hanging over us like a dark cloud. What happened to Mark out there? Lisa is the first to break the silence. Her voice is a soft whisper, mirroring the very thing that Mark described. He's alone out there, she says, more to herself than to us. Imagine what that kind of silence, that kind of isolation could do to you. Her eyes are wide, reflecting the glow of the monitor, her fingers absent-mindedly twisting a strand of hair. Alex lets out a slow, measured breath, as if to steady himself. Whispers, he says. It's got to be psychological. The guy's been up there too long, and the mind starts to play tricks. It's textbook. He's trying to inject some logic into the room, a life raft for us to cling to. I nod, attempting to latch onto Alex's rational explanation, but there's a tremor in my own hands that I can't quite suppress. Yeah, space psychosis, I agree, though the conviction isn't there. Commander Evans is silent, her gaze fixed on the frozen waveform on the screen. We need to consider all possibilities, she finally says, her voice steady but with an undercurrent of concern. And we need to keep this confidential, for now. The last thing we need is a panic. We move on to the next recording. Day 230, Mark's voice comes through the speakers, a little rough around the edges like he didn't sleep much. The shadows outside the hab. They don't look right. Angles are all wrong in the sunrise. It's like they're bending in ways that don't make sense. I know it's just rocks. Has to be. But man, it's like my brain's trying to make them into something else. There's a pause in the recording, and you can almost picture him out there, staring out the small windows at the cold red landscape squinting against the light of a distant sun. I've been working hard, you know. Long days, not much to break them up. It's probably just fatigue. Yeah, gotta be fatigue messing with my sight. The control room is quiet. We're all listening so intently that it feels like we're right there with him. I mean, I did all those tests, right? The ones before I left? The doc said I was solid but they didn't say what happens when you're the only guy on a whole planet trying to figure out if you're seeing things or if it's real. He laughs then, but it's not happy. It's the kind of laugh that says he's trying to keep it together. 
I'll do some extra checks on the habitat systems, make sure everything's tight and right. Can't have Mars dust getting in and mucking things up. That stuff's fine, like powder, gets everywhere. You can hear him moving around in the background, probably checking those systems he's talking about. But hey, let's not get all gloomy here. I've got a job to do, and I'm doing it. This is just, it's part of the deal, right? Being out here, pushing boundaries. Sometimes, you push back on your own mind a bit. There's another pause, longer this time, and when he speaks again, his voice is softer. I'm gonna sign off for now. Gotta keep on schedule, keep the routine. That's what keeps you going. That and thinking about getting back home. So, yeah, Pathfinder out. The recording ends. The control room is quiet. I press play on the next recording, and Mark's voice fills the room again. Day 230, he begins. The shadows outside the hab. They don't look right. Angles are all wrong in the sunrise. There's a pause. I've walked this surface a hundred times, charted every rock and every incline. But this morning, there's something off. His voice trails. It's like the rocks have moved overnight, except there's no trace of movement, no disruption in the dust that covers everything. There's a rustling sound. And the shadows. They stretch out in ways that don't make sense. Too long here, too short there, as if the light's bending around them. I know it's just rocks. It's Mars. There's nothing else here but rocks and dust. His attempt at reassurance sounds hollow even to us listening miles and years away. But sleep has been hard to come by. It plays with the eyes. The HAB sensors are all green, no external breaches, no internal failures. Mark's voice is methodical now, running down the checklist of a seasoned space traveler, making sure his sanctuary, his lifeline, remains intact. I ran diagnostics on my suit too, recalibrated the visor just to be sure, Everything checks out. He sighs, a sound that seems to carry the weight of the red planet itself. I'll keep monitoring the situation. Maybe it's a natural phenomenon I haven't encountered yet. Mars is still full of secrets after all. There's a determined note back in his voice, a hint of the explorer's spirit that must have driven him to undertake this mission in the first place. The transmission ends with a click, and in the control room, we're left with the echo of Mark's words and the profound silence that follows. Commander Evans stands, her face is stone, but her voice is calm. We need to consider all possibilities, including the psychological impact of prolonged isolation. Hallie was alone out there longer than anyone before him. Lisa's voice is small when she speaks next. Could it be some kind of space psychosis? Sensory deprivation? It happens, right? With that, we press play on the next recording. Day 235, he begins, his tone stripped of its usual composure. There's something moving out there, I swear. His next words are punctuated by a sharp intake of breath, a sound that makes the hair on my neck stand on end. It's not just noises anymore, it's... scratching like something's clawing at the habitat walls. His voice cracks. The communication system is down. I've tried to send distress signals, but there's just dead air coming back. I'm cut off. He says. I'm not alone on this planet, he states. I can't shake the feeling. During the day, it's just a nagging thought. But when the sun sets, it becomes a certainty. His voice drops to a whisper, as if he's, he's afraid he'll be overheard by whatever might be out there with him. I've double-checked the airlocks and ran diagnostics on every system. This habitat is sealed, nothing's getting in, or out. There's a pause, a moment where we can almost hear him pondering over his own words. Mark's voice tightens. I know how this sounds. I can hear the disbelief that would be in your voices if you could respond. I'm keeping the cameras rolling, recording everything. If you guys are hearing this, if these logs are making it back home, then maybe you'll see something I've missed, he
he says. The transmission ends, leaving an uncomfortable silence. The glow of monitors casts eerie shadows across the control room, reflecting off surfaces and the lenses of our glasses. It's late, and we're all showing the wear of the long hours. Then, Mark's voice fills the room again. Day 240. They're outside. Figures. In the dark. The words send a chill down my spine. I can see them moving when the sun sets. His voice continues. I've checked the systems. There's no malfunction. The external cams show nothing, but I know what I saw. You can hear him straining for rationality, for any explanation. It's like they know when I'm watching. They disappear whenever I try to get a visual. The transmission crackles, a brief interruption that makes us all jump. Suddenly it comes back to the sound of Mark's ragged breathing. I'm keeping the lights on now, all the time. It's the only way I can keep them at bay. We exchange uneasy glances, the team and I. No one wants to voice the fear that's creeping into our thoughts. They don't make a sound, not really. It's more like a... a feeling. A pressure that I can sense whenever they're close, Mark says. I tried to go out, to confront them, but the door... I couldn't open it, he says and I can hear the frustration in his voice. Maybe it's a safety feature, or maybe it's them keeping me in. It's a lot to take in, and we sit in silence as the transmission ends. Commander Evans is quiet, her fingers steepled in front of her lips as she listens. Play the rest, she commands. Day 242, he begins. His voice is so quiet we all lean in closer. The whispers are getting louder, he says, and it's like he's afraid to break the silence himself. At night, it's as if the whispers are coming from the walls themselves. His words are slow, careful, as if there's someone else here, speaking in a language that sounds familiar but I just can't understand it. It's driving me crazy. There's a break in his speaking, and we can all hear him take a deep, shaky breath. I've started whispering back, he continues and the idea of it sends chills through the room. I try to talk to them, whoever they are. I ask questions even though it feels weird talking to the walls. His voice stutters. There's never an answer, but I get this feeling, this really strong feeling, that whatever it is, it's listening to me. Day 244. It's getting harder to sleep now. Mark's voice fills the control room, even more strained than before. Every time I close my eyes, I feel like they're right there, just on the other side of the wall. I can't see them, but I sense them, like a cold spot in the air, a change in pressure. I keep the lights on and cycle through day and night, but it doesn't help. The whispers don't stop. I've mapped out the sounds, recorded where they're the loudest, trying to find a pattern. There's a sound of rustling papers. But there's nothing, no reason to it. Just noise. Noise that's almost words. It's like trying to listen to a conversation through a thick door. Today, I spent hours just listening, pressing my ear to the cold metal, trying to discern a single intelligible word. His voice cracks. Sometimes I shout back, challenging the void to answer me. But there's only silence. And then, when I'm about to give up, the whispers return. The logical part of me knows it's just my mind looking for company, for any sign I'm not alone. But there's another part, a part I can't silence, that wonders if there's more out there, something watching and waiting. There's a vulnerability in his voice that's new. I'm setting up more recorders tonight, trying to capture whatever this is. If it's just me, if I'm just losing it, then so be it. But if it's not, if there's something to this, I need evidence. I'll sign off for now. I need to save power for the recorders, and frankly, talking like this, it's using up oxygen I can't afford to waste. The room is silent, suffocatingly so, as I brace myself to play the final recording. My finger hovers over the button. None of us are truly ready to hear what comes next. The air feels thick, 
and there's a collective sense of dread that seems to press down on us. I press play. The sound that bursts forth is raw and unfiltered terror. Mark's screams claw their way out of the speakers, filling the room, filling my head until I think I can't take it anymore. It's a sound no training can prepare you for, the primal fear of a man facing the end alone. What the? Lisa's voice trails off into a gasp, her hand flying to her mouth in shock. The screams twist into pleas, Mark's voice begging, bargaining with unseen forces, with the universe itself, for a reprieve. Please, no! I can do more! I'm not ready! His words are desperate and disjointed, the sentences half-formed and laced with panic. Then, abruptly, there's laughter, but it's not the sound of joy or even sanity. It's the sound of a mind that's been pushed too far, teetering on the edge of the abyss. It's all a joke, right? A grand cosmic joke. Mark's voice is manic, unhinged. I reach out and lower the volume, my hand shaking. We shouldn't be listening to this, I murmur. But no one moves to stop the recording. It's like we're caught in the gravitational pull of the disaster unfolding before us. The next part of the transmission is a jumble of sounds that I struggle to piece together. There's the wrenching of metal the hiss of escaping air, and Mark's voice again, calmer now, a fatalistic edge to his words. The hull's breached. I can see the stars. They're beautiful. His voice is almost serene amidst the chaos. I guess this is it, huh? Alex stands abruptly, knocking his chair over. Turn it off, he says. We don't need to hear any more. But the recording plays on and Mark's voice is a whisper now, a whisper that fills the room, fills the silence left by our held breaths. Tell my family I love them. Tell them I was thinking of them until the end. And I'm sorry. So sorry. The room falls silent as the recording ends, not with a bang, but with the softest of whimpers, a silence that's louder than all the screams. Lisa's chair scrapes against the floor as she stands, her movements robotic. I need to... I need a minute, she says, and I watch her escape the room, her composure breaking with each step. In the aftermath of the recording, the control room feels like a tomb. The haunting finality of his last words lingers in the air, a specter that no amount of busy work or mission debriefs can exorcise. I sit motionless, my hands now lying flat on the console. There's a numbness that spreads from the tips of my fingers to the core of my chest, a defense mechanism, perhaps, against the reality of what we have just witnessed. The final moments of a man who faced the unknown with both humor and terror, and in doing so, showed us the very essence of humanity.